Hi everyone and welcome to this session on is heating the future of cooling. Um, the, the building industry is responsible for about 36% um, of CO2 emissions and about 50% uh, of, of energy is, is consumed by either heating or cooling in our buildings today. With renewables and decarbonization strategies from governments, from, from states, from cities, we, we have to look at how we, we decarbonize uh, the, um, the heating and the cooling industry. And that's why we're talking today about bringing those two together. My name is Jonas Hammann, and I have with me today uh, Mathilde Kaur Pedersen, who's going to explain a bit um, in a bit about uh, how we see it from a Danfoss perspective. Uh, and I have with me uh, Kevin Lane, who will um, who will talk about it from the IEA's perspective and dive a bit a bit more into to these numbers that I just mentioned. Uh, Kevin, he's a um, policy analyst uh, uh, at the International Energy Agency with a focus on energy efficiency. He has more than 25 years experience in the, in the field and he has an education in statistics and climatology. Uh, he, he has, amongst other things, worked on, on the cooling synthesis uh, report and he works for the Montreal Protocol uh, TIP uh, Energy Efficiency Task Force. So, Kevin, with that, I'll, I'll leave it to you. Okay, thank you for that kind introduction, Janis. Um, I'd like to take this opportunity to say good afternoon and welcome to all the delegates as well. Um, I hope you're all well in this um, strange time with this our economic and health crisis going on at the moment. But what I'd like to talk to you today is more about the um, climate imperative we have and talk about the role of heat pumps um, within heating and also cooling. Uh, if we look at the world today, we're currently emitting something like 30 to 33 gigatons of carbon at the moment and from energy related emissions. And if we want to be on a path towards reaching um, our Paris climate goals, we basically need to decarbonize by the middle towards the end of this century. And at the moment, our emissions are probably still going up. However, there are policies in place that we expect might stabilize some of these emissions, and that's one of our scenarios that we run. However, if we want to reach our sustainable development goals and also um, access to clean cooking and access to energy across the world, so the sustainability development goals, uh, we run something called our sustainability development scenario. And to get there, we're going to need a whole range of um, um, measures to get there, ranging from increasing the use of efficiency, renewables and other measures um, such as um, material efficiency and the like. So it's not going to be just one technology or measure that will get us there, there'll be a whole suite of them. And at the IEA, we track these clean energy um, developments in our Tracking Clean Energy Progress report. Here we track something like 46 technologies, and one of those is heat pumps. And here specifically, we're looking at heat pumps for heating in buildings, which consume a significant part of the energy and responsible for a lot of emissions around the world. However, heat pumps are also used in other sectors as well, whether that's um, appliances um, in industry and transport as well. But the focus here initially is just going to be on heat pumps in buildings. And at the moment, when we look at all these different technologies, most of them are off track in terms of um, meeting our sustainable development goals. If we look at heat pumps for heating around the world, we already have a technology that's already quite effective. So if we look at it compared to, say, a, a very efficient gas condensing boiler, a heat pump's already going to be more effective in terms of um, greenhouse gas emissions. In fact, probably 90% around the world is you're probably more carbon efficient to use a, a, a heat pump. If you'd asked this question um, 10 years ago, that figure would have been about 50%. So in those last 10 years, our electricity supplies become more uh, or less carbon intensive and heat pumps have become more efficient as well. So if we look at heat pumps around the world, so it is one of our key technologies for buildings. At the moment, they, they're selling in the order of millions, so quite a low level at the moment. And a lot of them will be in places like the US and Northern Hemisphere. And some of these have been driven primarily through um, government programs. So in China, say, there's a 
coal to electricity conversion programs to try get this cleaner energy in for um, uh, cleaner air reasons. In the US, it's been driven by federal tax cuts to try and install more ground source heat pumps. So there are um, heat pumps are becoming more important, but it's still at quite a, a low level. Importantly, the efficiency of them are also rising as well. So they're, they're quite magical products in that you put maybe one unit of energy in and you're getting three, four, maybe even more uh, energy coming out of them in the form of heat. So um, the performance of them is increasing. So that's the special part about heat pumps. However, we need to do more. For, we need to sell more of them and make, still make them even more efficient. If we to look in our sustainability scenario going up to 2050 and beyond, so by 2070, we basically need um, maybe a third or more of all the heating in the world to be coming from heat pumps. Um, that might be different in different parts of the world. So the United States might be a bigger proportion than, say, India, where maybe more renewables uh, might be used. So why isn't the uptake of heat pumps happening more? Uh, quickly and well there's probably a few reasons the typical ones are that at the moment the upfront cost is still um, quite expensive although it can be repaid by lower running costs um, but the life cycle cost is still relatively high also we have split incentives so that say a landlord might be buying the equipment and a tenant might be paying for the electricity bill so there's different incentive to install these heat pumps also, there's um, probably older buildings, there's the skills required to put these in. Um, and perhaps importantly, I think we're missing opportunities by looking at heating and cooling separately. Um, this is recognized by a lot of policymakers, and I suppose some of the typical responses are um, to provide regulations to mandate more efficient equipment going in, um, and also to provide information. So you have these MEPS, Minimum Energy Performance Standards, and also labels to help consumers. And one of the interesting ones, Canada is already looking to, for a minimum efficiency of 100% um, efficiency for heating equipment, which effectively means you have to have a heat pump um, for your heating. There are other options, of course. One of them is to maybe um, classify heat pumps as a renewable heat, um, which will allow other options, maybe tax rebates on the fuel and similar. There are other um, fiscal measures that could happen, maybe some of them is removing the subsidies on fuels, <coughs> and that'll provide a level playing field and also make it more cost effective to install heat pumps. Um, in the current climate, perhaps one of the most interesting one are, are COVID recovery packages. So governments are spending lots of money to try and um, boost the economy. And I think um, efficiency partic in particular is one of the key areas that governments are looking at. So efficiency is very useful because it's a clean energy, but it also generates a lot of jobs, maybe 15 jobs for every $1 million uh, invested, whereas fossil fuels would be substantially less. So it's one area where um, governments are very keen to try and spend some of their money. So if you look at the EU uh, green recovery package, um, there's maybe 750 billion, and a third of that maybe is going to go to um, clean energy. So I think we have a great opportunity in the short term and and, um, and incumbent on us to try and make sure that some of these technologies are coming through. Importantly, we should also be trying to set targets, whether that's through nationally determined contributions or national cooling plans, to try and um, signpost where we'd like to go to in these types of technologies. And of course, as well as the technology, there's also building codes which can be used to make the um, the fabrics of the buildings better, so we require less heating. So um, most countries around the world are improving their building codes to make sure that you can have a better fabric of the building, but that might also uh, um, imply that you may need more heat pumps in the buildings as well. Okay, so um, I've talked mainly about heat pumps for space heating. However, they can be used in a whole um, range of other applications as well. And on the top right, you can just see a typical vapor compression cycle that's used in a, a refrigerator or an air conditioner. And just to briefly explain what it is, um, basically putting um, refrigerant into a loop, which is going clockwise in this diagram. You put a little bit of electricity into a compressor and that compresses your refrigerant and that raises the temperature of that refrigerant as it's going around. Then to the right-hand side, that refrigerant goes over some very large coils, um, um, 
and these with an electric fan can then push off the hot air um, to the outside of a building if it's a AC unit, unit um, or um, inside a building if it's for heating. That then cools down a little bit and once it goes through an expansion valve, the refrigerant will cool down even further as it expands and again it goes through some a big set of coils, evaporator coils and that can um, then be blown off with a fan as well so you blow the cool air off and that warms it up and it goes back to the compressor again. So this cycle just goes round and round. So it's used in multiple um, applications. So the obvious ones are refrigerators. Um, so there's maybe a billion or more of these in the world. In space cooling, um, there's already about 2 billion air conditioning units in the, the world. And by 2050, there could be say 6 billion. So compared to the millions of heat pumps, um, air conditions are substantially um, greater in the stock. And this is where a lot of the development will happen. They're improving in efficiency and their costs are also falling all the time. In the residential sector, we see heat pumps becoming more common and they might use about half the electricity of a conventional dryer. Uh, in industrial sectors, there's uh, many uses it can be used in. So perhaps say water heating and pulp manufacturing and actually lots of um, water heating and drying processes across all of this industry. Uh, a nice example is pasteurization where you're both heating and cooling during the different processes. So here you've got very good opportunity for moving heat around with heat pumps to try and um, do that very, very efficiently. Um, but importantly, there's also two big areas of district heating you can also make use of such technology and um, especially heat recovery. I think there's a very large um, potential there for greater development of heat pump technology. Um, so, in conclusion, just like to say, um, we have a climate imperative which is to try to substantially reduce our energy-related CO2 emissions. So, within that, we'll need a whole host of technologies, but heat pumps have got a, a huge role to play for heating of buildings, um, and we'll need to deploy them at a much greater level, even at higher efficiencies. And the way we're going to do this is basically through, um, from a government perspective, of better regulations, more information, and also financial incentives. Um, I would also um, highlight then from this, the takeaway message is that heat pumps are really a key technology for heating, but actually there's a whole host of other applications, and one of, or two of which we'll hear about shortly. So at this point, I'd like to hand back to you, Jonas. Thank you very much for that presentation, Kevin. Um, I thought it was very interesting to hear about the the outlook that you have on decarbonization uh, for for 2050 and uh, what uh, part that heat pump uh, heat pumps play in that picture i heard you saying that that the technology is ready and that we have many different applications for the technology um but what what i also noticed was that you mentioned that for heating and cooling from a policy perspective, we have, have to look at them separately. But from a technology perspective, we have to start thinking them more and more together. And I think that's that's quite interesting. Um, I think it's also very good to hear, you know, that that uh, that you're focused on um, uh, upskilling and and creating jobs. And you also say that heat pumps will play um, or renewable energies will play a, a quite important factor in this. Um, so on on um, on that note, and on, on the exact note that you mentioned, mentioned about uh, using uh, the waste heat from, from uh, processes, I think that uh, is an is a excellent um, segue to, to our next, next presenter, uh, Mathilde Kaur Pedersen. And Mathilde, she has been with Danfoss for, for more than 13 years, and she has held uh, a, ver uh, a long range of different positions within uh, product management. Uh, in relation to compressors, in relation to heat pumps uh, and system solutions or, or condensing units. And today, Matilda is the global director for um, refrigeration. So with that, Matilda, I'll leave it uh, to you. Thank you, Jonas. So yeah, very interesting, uh, Kevin. And I think I'll be echoing some of your your messages as well here. But uh, yeah, is is heating the the future of cooling? I think we have already seen that for uh, for years the cooling. 
players, so both for components and units, they have been going into this sector. And especially in the residential sector, we have seen a lot of the heat pump manufacturers actually coming first from the cooling world, moving into heat pumps and, and for sure also for the, for the components. And now with the development of this district heating and, and the way that it is changing, which we will look at at the, at the next slide, then it's the, the, even the district heating sector is becoming much more accessible for the cooling players. And, uh, and the fantastic part of this heat pump is, as, uh, as you also mentioned, Kevin, that uh, with the technology of the heat pump, but also heat recovery, we can really significantly reduce the environmental impact of our heating consumption. So if we now have a look here at the uh, at the district heating, so basically district heating is a is a flexible thermal uh, infrastructure, you could say. So where different kind of energy sources can be plugged in or, or connected to the system, and then the energy in form of either hot or, or cold water is then distributed into buildings and can be either used immediately or stored in, in tanks. Uh, so it can be stored for some hours or, or days, or it's even possible to store the heat for several months in some uh, special, very large storage facilities or even in some large pits. Um, and this way, the district energy network can provide a kind of twofold flexibility to the energy systems because it is providing both the storage and it's enabling to switch between different energy sources such as the large scale heat pumps or, or waste heat, solar thermal um, and, and so on. And by implementing renewable energy sources and utilizing the, the waste heat generated from the industry, the environmental gain from these district heating plants become or district heating networks become even more evident. And I think it's actually moving more and more in the direction of the focus decreasing from building the energy plants uh, or the heating plants, these very large scale plants, to actually much more being about managing the, the different uh, energy sources and, and also heating sources being connected into the district heating. And here on the graph, you can see uh, an illustration of what has happened over the years with the uh, district heating networks. And we're now at the fourth generation of district heating. And this is where it becomes feasible to uh, implement more different energy sources because the uh, building heating demands are lowered, but also the ability to supply lower temperature uh, heating is, is now more feasible. So, so therefore, these networks, as they develop, they become more and more uh, useful for connecting different energy sources and therefore also uh, reducing the, the environmental impact. Because we can move to, to more uh, or less energy intensive uh, systems. If we have a look at one of these uh, networks on the next slide, so in Drammen in Norway, here we have it. In, in Drammen in Norway, they had a district heating plant um, and, and they decided they needed to, to change it. They wanted to go for a non-fossil fuel solution. Uh, it had to be with a natural refrigerant and not impacting the global warming as well as they wanted a max or a, a high energy efficiency. So this led to them deploying this ammonia fjord sourced heat pump. And, uh, and this heat pump is able to heat the water up to 90 degrees, which, which is really quite high. But for, for those kind of high temperatures, ammonia is really a, a fantastic uh, refrigerant for that. The, the heat plant is uh, annually providing 67 gigawatt hour of heating. And it is right now, at least, it's covering more than 60% of the heating demand in Ramen. When it was installed some years back, it was actually covering 85% of the heating demand. Uh, so, so it's really a, a significant coverage of the demand that they have for this heat pump. And they obtained a 2 million euro saving per year, making their payback much faster than what it would have been with, with other solutions. Due to the heat pump, as Kevin also mentioned, being much less uh, energy 
intensive. That was, of course, uh, part of the reason for these two millions. And uh, as you explained, uh, Kevin, you have this uh, input of one and an output of three, which is uh, magical, as you say. I don't know if they're going to make a Norway scat talent for technology soon, because uh, then uh, I think this would be a good winner candidate in this uh, in such a TV show. Uh, anyway, if uh, if all Nordic municipalities that have district heating plants close to the sea, they implemented this, then we could actually reduce the CO2 emissions by almost 1.5 megaton. And, and this is a, a, a big number. So just to bring it down to, to earth and compare it to number of cars, then uh, it would be the same as if we removed 300,000 cars from the road for a year. So this is really very significant for the, uh, for the environment impact. If we have a look at the at the next slide here, where we um, look at a different kind of structure for a heat pump. So this is the distributed heat recovery heat pump systems, which um, which is smaller compared to the more centralized ones. Um, examples of this can be, for example, in an industrial manufacturing process. It can be in a supermarket or a co-location data center or maybe a refrigerated warehouse, they would have these kind of systems. So these applications, they are typically providing both cooling and heating, and, and therefore they have a, a dual revenue stream, you could say, and, and also helping to shorten the payback period. And as uh, Kenshin also, Kevin, sorry, Kevin also mentioned, then these kind of systems are really breaking with this pattern of a uh, monofunction design practice, where in the past we were really designing only for uh, cooling, refrigeration, or heating. So here it's combining the systems and getting the, the best out of both. Um, the size of these kind of systems, uh, the distributed heat recovery heat pumps, are generally driven by the load that is needed in the facility. So this can, for example, be the cooling load that is needed for a, a data center or a supermarket. And, and typically, it will be the, in the range of the 2 to 10 megawatt. Um, and then the heating, if it is a cooling application, then the heating becomes the, the second output of this system. So um, what happens is that when there is the infrastructure of a centralized district heating system, then such systems that are actually built for a facility can be connected and provide that additional input into the he heating system. So uh, they can be and, and are, of course, already being used by the district heating utilities to replace more and more the fossil fueled uh, heating systems. And it's for these kind of systems that the oil-free technology, we believe it, it becomes very interesting because um, with the oil-free technology, it is reducing the complexity of the system as you don't need to have oil separators, or oil coolers, and so on, but also for the maintenance part of it, because as there's no oil, you no longer need to do oil checks, change the oil filters, or uh, even add additional oil to the systems. And then on top, the technology offers a very quiet operation with a very high efficiency. And on, you also have still the choice of uh, selecting a low DWP refrigerant, so improving even more the environmental uh, benefits for such systems. Then if we have a look at the next slide, which is uh, heat recovery. So heat recovery is probably already one of the most known opportunities to improve the energy cost in a supermarket because heat is basically a byproduct of the refrigeration uh, process. So it's for free in, in the system, you could say. And with the CO2 refrigeration systems, uh, we're able to recover fairly high temperatures of heat com and combining that with an appropriately dimensioned uh, low temperature heat equipment, then we are actually able to recover uh, or cover the need of uh, 30 to 50 percent of the demand uh, that, that is needed in the facility. And that is without increasing the discharge uh, pressure, because if we increase the discharge pressure, then there's actually even more to gain on, on the heating side from this system. Uh, and in the areas where there is a district heating system, these heat recovery systems can, of course, be connected to that. But if they're in conjunction with some kind of multi-use buildings or apartments, 
then um, or offices, a shopping mall, or, or whatever they can be, then the the supermarket can actually become the heating central, you could say, for this whole building. To add on top of that, it also shows that supermarkets are often not using the full compressor capacity for their refrigeration need. So if these compressors that are idle are being exploited for a heat pump usage, then the heat pump output can of course be even greater than what we see it today. And the supermarkets can really become a decentralized heating supplier or if the district heating infrastructure is there, they can of course provide this heat into the district heating. Uh, if we look at the graph here on the on the right side, then you can see the savings in CO2 emissions uh, by implementing these different technologies that we have been looking at. Um, and also in combination, either standalone or in com combination with the district heating. And what we have added here also is together with the scenario of using fossil fueled uh, based electricity or a more volatile electricity mix or energy mix uh, for the electricity. So with the more volatile mix, which the district heating can, can manage, then we can get even more reduction in the CO2 emissions. So I think the, the technology shows that there's clearly benefits not just for reducing the operating cost but the but in reducing the co2 emissions this is really the way to go to move away from the very monofunction design practice and and look at the at the full uh, potential in fact of of these systems so uh, with that being said i think uh, i can conclude that from our side heating is definitely the future of uh, of cooling and over to you, uh, Jonas. Thank you very much, uh, Mathilde. Uh, and thank you, uh, Kevin, for, for two, uh, two very um, interesting and, and, uh, and good presentations. Uh, Mathilde, from, from your presentation, I thought it was very interesting um, how um, you build upon what Kevin said in terms of the district energy system um, and how maybe the, key, the heating and the cooling se sector should start talking uh, more together as, as the lie and opportunity for both parts uh, in, in, in doing that. And how, and how these uh, low temperature district energy systems allows for new business opportunities, both for, for the supermarket owner, as you mentioned here at the end, but also for a data center or or other uh, buildings that 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 the uh, benefits from both using the the cooling and the heating side, um, and and in some it can help uh, decarbonize our our um, our buildings and it can he uh, help decarbonize our our societies. Um, so I think it's 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 very interesting. And and just the last point that I also um, uh, noticed was you know how. Um, the, the, the heating and the cooling sector and heat pumps more specifically can help uh, balancing uh, the, uh, the, uh, the fluctuating renewables that comes in. And, and again, as you showed on the graph, we, we can actually use that as a benefit for, for decarbonization. Um, so, so with that, I want to, to thank both you, uh, Matilde and, and Kevin, for, for the presentations. And I want to t thank the the listeners and the, and the viewers for, for following this um, presentation and, and enjoy the rest of the conference.